Greetings all, Ferrari Man 601 here. Today we're going to do something a little bit different. This is going to be a little bit of a how-to and show-and-tell on a Ruger PC carbine. What I intend to do with this is do a complete teardown and then complete reassembly uh, just to show you the ins and outs of this rifle and uh, how it works and generally what you do to clean it and otherwise maintain it and just generally what it does and why it does the things that it does because I find this to be an extremely well thought out piece. Everything in here, it's extremely well designed and everything serves an explicit purpose and it's designed with functionality and serviceability in mind. So I've been very impressed so far with this firearm and I just want to show you a little bit as to why that is. Now, first of all, Good practice, and actually it's not just good practice, it's mandatory practice. What do we always assume about a firearm? We always assume that a firearm is loaded, right? So the first thing you do upon encountering any firearm is you need to verify what its status is, what condition is it in. I have a magazine in here and I have a closed chamber. I cannot tell if this firearm is loaded or not. I know that it is not because I do not store them loaded and this one actually is stored partially disassembled anyway with no chance of being loaded or fired. However, to illustrate, this is your drop mag check chamber situation. I don't know if I've got anything in the magazine and I don't know anything about the chamber. My finger's nowhere near the trigger, right? We're going to drop the magazine right there. Magazine is empty, you can see that. And then we're going to open the chamber and take a look inside. On this firearm, there is a bolt lock, which is just forward of the trigger here. So I'm going to pull back on the bolt to open it. I'm going to depress the bolt lock and let the bolt go. I can look inside. I can see that the chamber is empty. I can feel inside, and I can see that the chamber is empty there, and I can confirm that with what I'm feeling inside. So we have got an empty chamber, and a magazine is out. So this is a safe firearm. Right, so we've gone through our check, we've confirmed that there is no ammunition in the magazine or the chamber. I have no ammunition in this workspace. This firearm is not going to be loaded at any point during this. So here's our magazine, it's empty. We're not gonna to need to do anything with this, so we're just going to put this aside. The first step in the disassembly of the PC carbine is actually what we just did, the safety check. This is what they call a takedown. And by takedown, we mean that the rifle, as you see it here, this is its fully assembled and ready to function state, but it's not the only state that it can be in. What we can do with this one is disassemble it partially for storage or transport or quick inspection and, of course, for maintenance. And the way that I always store this one is actually in that partially disassembled state, the takedown state. What makes this rifle different from others is that it does have this takedown feature. What I mean by that is, on the bottom here of the fore end of the rifle, you will see that we have got this little lever, right? This is actually a locking mechanism that locks the fore end and the barrel into the stock of the rifle, where the action is, the upper receiver here, and the barrel threads in there, and the chamber is actually formed when those two sections come together. So it's actually an added safety feature twofold. One, in order to remove the barrel, first, the bolt has to be open which means the magazine has to be out, which means that it cannot be loaded, which means that you've already checked it by default, so I like that. And then this lever here comes forward, like so, probably difficult for you to see, but this little lever here comes forward, and then what you're able to do is when this lever comes forward, we twist to our left about 45 degrees, and then the barrel comes out like so. The chamber is actually this end of the barrel right here, you see? So you cannot possibly load this firearm in this configuration now. We have got our receiver here with our magazine well, with our bolt, but the chamber is right here on the end of the barrel. So now at this point, this is effectively a paperweight. It's an entirely inert device with no potential even of being loaded and fired. So this is now what they call the takedown configuration. And it's in this state that the firearm will most often be stored or transported. And again, like I said, it's entirely inert. 
in this configuration. It's just a very expensive paperweight at this point. But that's the takedown function. Now at this point, the materials that we're going to need if we want to go farther with this, honestly, the only tool that you really require to completely disassemble this firearm is either this screwdriver, this is a Torx bit, uh, to be specific, it is a T25, you probably are not going to be able to read that at all, but uh, there it is, T25, Torx 25. So this is what's going to fit basically all of the fastener hardware on this. And to completely take this thing apart, the only fasteners that you need to remove, as in threaded fittings, there are only three on the whole firearm, which is absolutely amazing to me. And it really speaks to the design work that went into this. It's a very well thought out piece. But there are three threaded fasteners on this. There are two here on the stock, and these hold the receiver and trigger group in place. And then there is one further here on the fore end here underneath the barrel. This one, in terms of regular maintenance, regular cleaning, you don't necessarily have to remove the fore end grip here, um, but we will just for illustrative purposes. But effectively, there is no moving part inside here that you're ever really going to have to mess around with. Uh, no powder gets in here. It really doesn't get dirty, but we'll remove that anyway just to show how it works. However, uh, the first thing that we're going to do here is we're going to take a look there at that fore end. And as you can see, just the uh, fastener and the Torx bit, and then obviously it is right to tight, left to loose. We've broken the tension on that screw. And these screws are all captive. You don't want to go too far with removing these um, because they just get into a little brass retainer ring and you'll, you'll strip that out. You won't hurt the screw any, but you'll strip that out. But uh, here you can see, that uh, we have got the fore end grip removed and it's just done in uh, composite plastic material. It's very sturdy, um, it's not very heavy at all, but it is very sturdy. You can see that there's some cross bracing in there to add some rigidity if you're gripping this thing hard or trying to control recoil, uh, muzzle rise, anything like that if you're gonna fire it rapidly. But uh, yeah, everything in here, and as you can see, it, it's, it's extremely clean in here. There's really nothing to get dirty. This little drop of oil on that screw is the only thing that I've ever done in there in terms of doing anything with this. But the uh, screw there, it's, it's just captive. It's not gonna fall out, and that's because it's on a brass retainer ring which is inside there underneath the little grommet. So nothing you're gonna do. This is the access window for the lever to uh, perform the takedown function. And if we take a look at the barrel itself now, you can see the mounting hardware that uh, connects it to the stock there. Here's the block that's holding all of that in place. And then this right here is the takedown lever, spring-loaded, obviously. And you can see the uh, little flange there, little piston-type catch that comes in and out as I actuate that. Spring-loaded in there, so um, every now and again a drop of oil won't hurt it. But generally, unless you start to see any sort of corrosion in here, really nothing to worry about. This little piece of hardware right here, this is just a tensioning ring. Because this is a takedown, sometimes there might be a little bit of play between the barrel and the stock. This is a little adjustment there that you'd be able to adjust when this is assembled just to take out that last bit of slack if there is any. But generally, that's about it. Your sights here, they are adjustable. Um, there's not much adjustment that uh, I've ever had to do on this, but uh, you've got the sights here, you've got a little I guess they call this a peep sight, but it's a little ring sight. And then your front sight is uh, a nice blade that is shielded on either side. So I do like that a lot. A lot of people, they like to put scopes and things on these. Personally, I'm never really going to have a need to do something like that. And quite honestly, I just like the aesthetic of this without having anything added to it. So it's going to be just iron sights for me, and uh, I don't have any issues with those. The only other function on the barrel that uh, we should take a look at is right here at the muzzle. We do have a thread protector here, uh, as this is a threaded barrel. That simply screws off, as you would expect, right to tight, left to loose. And uh, it's quite a long stack of threads there, but uh, it does eventually come off. And uh, then, of course, you can see uh, that we just have our bare threads there and a little O-ring just for some uh, gas sealant there. Um, really doesn't have much of a function, but there's the thread protector inside. Obviously, it's all uh, lubricated there because I did that the last time I cleaned the firearm. 
Um, but yes, that does mean that we do have a threaded barrel on here. Obviously, check your local jurisdiction in terms of uh, the laws and other regulations regarding any muzzle-mounted accessories. I know that effectively to me, this is useless in my jurisdiction, uh, so there's no reason ever really to remove the thread protector, but uh, it is uh, a function there. And again, if you do live in a locale where you can have muzzle-mounted accessories, uh, that is something that the PC carbine uh, is able to accommodate right out of the box. Again, this is uh, just straight up Ruger, no modifications ever done to this one. It is as it left the factory. So putting the barrel aside now, we will turn our attention to the stock, right? So this is where most of the magic happens here on the PC carbine. It's in the same configuration that we left it when we did our check and our takedown. So we have got an open bolt, we have got a magazine out. It does mean that we do have a trigger that is primed and ready to go. So be careful with that because there is some tension that is built up in that trigger mechanism. but you can take it apart with the trigger cocked, right? So it's not going to make a difference. My safety is on, it's a through bolt safety right here. Turn that off, put that back on. Doesn't make a difference for our disassembly. What does make a difference for our disassembly though is the following. We do need to be removing these two screws here at the bottom. They are the same retainer screws as you get with the fore end, the same T25 Torx bit. So, same deal, we go in, we give it a little bit of a firm turn to the left, we break the tension on that first one, I'll go forward here and we'll break the tension here on that second one just so that we get symmetrical forces as much as possible through here. And then we'll just start to remove them. You can see that the trigger assembly already got, got a bit loose there, and the trigger assembly is actually held into the upper receiver here with pins, right? So there are other fasteners that uh, are resident here in this firearm, but they're not threaded ones. They're not screws, so we don't need any other specialized tools to uh, be removing those, which is always very, very nice. So we should, and I caution should, because sometimes these screws are a little bit longer than you think they are. So just give it a little bit of a push there on the trigger and you'll see that the receiver is starting to come out of the stock, okay? So all we do from this point is a little bit more of a grab on there on both of those screws, and as you can see, they're completely um, slack now. I can just do that by hand without any sort of problem. And slightly finicky sometimes, but again, they do come out, and you uh, have already figured out how this comes apart, I am sure. But, give it a grab and there you go. So the receiver is now out of the stock and you can see now we just have the stock empty but for the magwell which we'll take a look at later on because that's another very cool feature about the PC carbine. So we'll put the stock over here and now your entire action, the whole receiver and trigger in here and that's that. That's pretty cool. Now at this point we have got our receiver out, we've got our trigger still in there, we have got our bolt open, okay? The next thing that we have to do if we want to disassemble this further is we need to bring the bolt back forward to close the chamber and then we need to release the trigger because right now that's, that's cocked, right? So we are going to release our bolt just like we did before, right? So the bolt's closed, we're going to take our trigger safety off, and then we're just gonna pull the trigger. Right, so that releases all of the tension in there. This is now an entirely tension-free affair, okay? The next thing that we must do is we need to remove the bolt handle, or they call this the charging handle. We need to remove it no matter what you wanna call it. So there is one more threaded fastener, I lied. There are four, not three but just like we did on the stock in the forend, we are just going to give this a firm twist to the left. And that breaks the tension. And then we start to remove that 
This is not a captive screw, so it will come out if you're not careful. But uh, there it is. Also take your Torx bit out if you're not careful. But um, there it is. There is your screw. And uh, this screw, this uh, charging handle, this bolt handle, was a real bear to get out when I first uh, acquired this firearm. I don't know what happened, but you can see that there are traces of anti-seize or Loctite, something on those threads, and it was just a bear to get that off the first time. I, uh, I, basic, I had to get on the floor and clamp the uh, rifle fully assembled to get as much leverage as possible and clamp the thing between my legs, between my knees, and just yank on this screwdriver in order to get that broken. But once I did get it broken, uh, I did not put it back on that tight, quite obviously, and it's just been very easy, smooth sailing ever since. So all sorts of stuff going on here, and uh, it's just been absolutely marvelous. Next thing that we uh, need to do then, because we have removed the um, charging handle here, now that allows us to go deeper into our disassembly. So the first thing that we need to do is remove the pins that are holding the trigger to the receiver. Because you can see here, in order for us to get anything deeper down, we're going to have to take this trigger out. And uh, it's secured by those pins, so we will go ahead and remove those pins. Now, if you wanted to use a small punch uh, to get these pins out, you can. Nothing wrong with that. Um, but I'm just going to use the uh, side here of my Torx bit, because the, the uh, Torx bit itself is a bit too wide to get on there square. But if I use the side of it, I can just get in there and just put a little bit of downward pressure on both of those pins, and they start to work themselves out pretty easily. Um, I get on this side. You can see that we're just a little bit too close to the uh, side of the receiver there in order to get anything through, but a little bit more of an angle on that. And they start to come through. And at this point, uh, you can get within half a chance of grabbing them and starting to uh, get them to work themselves out. There you go. There's one. Looks like this one just might need a slight bit more persuasion. There we really go. It actually did get all the way down through there. So that's cool. Some uh, upward pressure on the trigger guard might help just to make sure that those holes stay entirely in line. Otherwise they might um, give a little bit of tension onto these pins, but that's all the pins are. They are just through bolt pins there, no threads on them or anything like that. Once we have got those pins removed, we want to place the receiver upside down with the rail on the bottom. And then the trigger just lifts out like so. And uh, you can see in here, there's your hammer spring, there's your hammer, this is the whole trigger. <laughs> it's right there. There is an additional pin, uh, a couple additional pins. There's one here that holds the hammer in, and then if you really wanted to take this apart, if you wanted to take the trigger out, um, there's this retainer pin here. If you wanted to swap triggers or you had any work that you needed to do in there. But uh, for the most part, you can get in here just like this for general cleaning and maintenance. Sometimes I do take the hammer out um, because that also grants some easier access to the hammer spring that sometimes comes out on its own accord as well. Um, so just be warned of that, but really this is as far as you ever need to take the trigger. So that's your whole trigger assembly, and we can just put that aside as well, and put your pins aside as well. I like to group things together, so I have got the pins next to the trigger assembly, um, next to the bolt handle, right? So the pins anyway belong to the trigger, so I'm not going to get them mixed up. But that just leaves us here with our receiver totally opened up and ready for the next step, which actually doesn't require any tools at all. You'll see here, this is a, a little rubber backstop here, and it's just sitting in there under some very light spring tension because our recoil spring is right in there, and this is attached to the recoil spring. In order to remove the whole rest of the action here, the, um, the whole bolt carrier assembly, all we need to do is just wedge our, in my case, the thumb behind there, push it forward, then grab it with the thumb and forefinger, and then just lift up, and you'll see the recoil spring comes right out, and it takes the rest of the uh, bolt carrier assembly out, right? 
So there we go. This is just the receiver casement now, and uh, this is now completely free of any real mechanization. And you could get in there for cleaning if you needed to. So now this is the whole rest of the action right in front of us. This uh, is the bolt carrier plate with a recoil spring captive, so that's fine. And uh, when you pull the charging handle, that's the sound that you hear. So that's all cool. You also hear the chimes of Westminster right now, which I was trying to avoid, but hey, I'm doing this in one take, so you're going to have to contend with that for another five or so seconds before it completely drowns out. And there we go. So yes, this is the recoil spring, bolt carrier plate, and that's the wonderful noise you hear when you charge the firearm. This just slides off like so. This is the underside of the carrier plate, recoil spring, and that's that. You can put that aside, and of course this is a carbon steel rod that the spring is wound around. So I'm going to put that aside. So now, what we see here, remember that we are looking at this this is the top side where we're looking at here. This is therefore the bottom side, right? So this is the area that you will not see. Here we have got our breech face. So the round is going to sit in here um, with the primer facing here because this hole is where the firing pin comes out of. And the firing pin, we can't see it at all, but it sits inside this channel right here. Um, and of course it's all inside, this is all flush. So real cool. You can also see some wear marks setting in here from because this uh, this one got some use. So um, we have gotten ourselves some wear. So this is actually very useful in showing you where to lubricate. So basically, I just coat this entire thing in a very thin film of oil, which is currently getting all over my hands. But uh, that's all you do. This is the uh, side. This is the right side where the charging handle would be. And then this is your extractor right here, which uh, is going to be the next thing that we remove. So there is no strict hard and fast reason as to why you must remove the extractor every time you service the firearm. However, generally when I'm cleaning this, I do take it all the way down to the extent that I am showing you here because it's just best practice in my opinion. And uh, honestly, I just like working on stuff, whatever it is, whether it's cars or engines or firearms, I'm just interested in how they operate. So uh, to me, I don't have any issue with doing this. So your extractor is here, and the way that it works is obviously this is a breech face, and uh, the round, remember this is, I should have said this in the beginning, but this is obviously chambered in 9mm Luger. So the uh, casing has a flange on it, or a rim, right? So it's going to grab the flange at the bottom of the casing and then when the bolt comes back it's going to rip it out and then the ejector in the mag well is going to run into the back of it and then it's going to fling it out of the chamber bolt comes back forward the magazine springs doing its thing and then it's going to engage with the follower and the ramp and then the bolt comes forward the rest of the way and jams it into the chamber and you're ready to go again but yes this is a critical part of ejecting a spent case. If this either is not installed or something's wrong with it, the geometry's wrong or it's broken, you're probably going to have failures to eject, which then is going to mean failures to feed, which means malfunctions, and you're not going to have a very fun day at the range. So this is an important part, and uh, which means it is something that you need to be careful about if you're working on this. The other thing you got to be careful about if you're working on this is the extractor is obviously spring-loaded, otherwise it wouldn't be a very good extractor. So what you need to do is locate this pin. This is the retention pin for the extractor assembly. There are two components to this, three if you count the pin. You have the extractor itself, which is the flange you can see here. You have the extractor spring directly underneath it, and then you've got the pin. So in order to prevent this from flying all over the place, when you remove this, you want to hold the extractor down and, and put some force behind it. This little well here is where the spring is, so I just like to put the tip of my thumb over that and press. At that point, you can take your pin and you can use your fingernail to just pry up on that, and then the pin comes out. Slowly release the tension underneath your thumb, and there you go. The extractor comes out, 
and the extractor spring comes out. Note the orientation of the extractor spring. Uh, obviously it goes in here, but if you're unfamiliar with this, don't try to jam it in sideways or anything because you will ruin it and then you will be out of luck in terms of your extractor. Also, again, be mindful of the tension it's under. This can fly off the moment that you remove that pin and hit you in the eye or something like that. You don't want to do that. Um, for a small piece of kit, it actually does have a fair bit of mass, and if it got going 20, 30 mile an hour, it would do some damage to your face, so be careful. Uh, beyond that, we now have our extractor removed, and then the next thing that we can do is address these two pins which are holding our breech face in, right? In order to remove these, again, no tools required, we have two options. One, we can compress the breech face a little bit because this is against the firing pin and the firing pin spring. So the firing pin spring is exerting a little bit of pressure this way, which means that as I compress this, I am bringing everything back into equilibrium in terms of the tension, right? So you can press that in and then pry up on these two pins and then they come out, or you can do it the quicker way which is to flip this back right side up and then compress the breech face again and just play with it a little bit. I'm just compressing and releasing and oh, there we go. Pin number one, pin number two, we'll come back forward or other side up rather and we release the tension very slowly and there we go. Breech face comes out like so. This is the side that's facing the cartridge, and this is the side that's facing the firing pin and the uh, other end of the bolt right there. So that's cool. And now we have something else to play with. Right here is the firing pin and its firing pin spring, which is not captive, mind you. So again, be very careful with this. It's not under tension anymore, but it's not captive either. So it will come off of the firing pin and uh, you will lose it if you're not careful. Just tilt this forward, the firing pin comes out. This is the back side of the firing pin that the hammer strikes. And then the firing pin spring just comes out, not under tension anymore. It's effectively just a slightly heavier gauge spring than the one that you get in, in a standard retractable ballpoint pen, right there. And then the firing pin itself Obviously, this is the end that impacts the primer. It's not very sharp. It's just blunt force trauma to those primers, and then they go bang, and then uh, the charge goes bigger bang. So that is cool, and that's your firing pin. Again, this is done in carbon steel, I believe. Very strong, very rigid, as you would expect a firing pin to be, because there is a biblical amount of force going through this little rod. So very, very cool there. And then the very last thing that we have to remove from our bolt assembly is this. This doesn't look like much, but this, I think, is actually the coolest part of the firearm. This is the dead blow weight or the recoil absorption weight or whatever you want to call it, but this is a tungsten brick. Tungsten is a very dense metal. It's an element, right? It's also uh, used in light bulb filaments, or at least it was before light bulbs got banned. So this is a tungsten brick. To remove it, we just flip it over, and then we just let it fall into our fingers. So there it is. This is heavy. I'm not entirely sure how much this weighs, but it probably weighs about one and a half pounds, okay? So there is a fair amount of weight in the rifle just from this dead blow weight. And the function of this is it lessens the momentum transfer between the bolt and the stock and therefore the stock and your shoulder and it does a great job with recoil absorption thereby um, but it's 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 a heavy thing obviously you can see where it's been drilled out and machined out to achieve a specific weight and uh, it's just another thing that I like about the engineering on this firearm it's just so much attention to detail was taken in this and I mean for and they didn't skimp on materials either they easily could have made something like this out of cast iron or or just plain old carbon steel it would have had to be physically larger in order to make the same density but they chose tungsten because even though tungsten is a very expensive element it uh, it's very dense 
and so they can get the weight that they needed in the form factor that they needed. So that's great. And it also explains why tungsten has a whole bunch of other applications as a ballast material and, of course, great applications in electrical engineering as well. But that's what this is, the tungsten dead blow weight. You can see through here it's been machined through because the firing pin goes through here. So that's cool. And obviously they've taken all that into consideration when machining the rest of this for the weight as well. So that's great. Meanwhile, this is our now completely disassembled bolt assembly. And here, uh, this is where the dead blow weight will go. Just a little residue in there. It's not corrosion, that's just uh, characteristics of the metal. And you can see some machining witness marks in there as well. Real cool. like all of that immensely. Just great, great stuff. Absolutely great stuff. You'll also notice here, this is, uh, yeah, this is right side up and forward. Bolt handle hole here. We go on to the left side. So forward is now in this direction. Bolt handle hole here. So you can um, swap the bolt handle position on the PC carbine. I keep it on the right side because I'm right-handed and it's just more comfortable for me. And it also ejects on the right, so I tend to put uh, ejection port with bolt handle location, but obviously your preferences may vary. And uh, that's just what the receiver and, and uh, bolt assembly allows you to do. You can play with all kinds of things. The uh, PC carbine's very modular firearm and it's just, it's very adaptable. And as you can see, very easy to disassemble. Now the last thing to take a look at here while we've got the PC carbine disassembled is back on our stock. Right here, this is our magazine well. And there are a couple things to take a look at here in the magazine well. This is our ejector. So in other words, this works in conjunction with the extractor. As the extractor has a grip on the spent cartridge and the bolt is coming back, the primer side of the spent cartridge is going to ram, ram itself into this extractor and that's going to send it out the side of the ejection port. So that's how that works, but the other part of this is, this is the magazine well. This is where the magazine fits in. If we take a look at a magazine, we can put it in here, and that is where the magazine sits. So that's really cool. And uh, yeah, you can see there how the magazine fits there into the bottom of the stock through the magazine well. It's all locked up. And uh, obviously if we had um, the uh, firearm assembled, we would have feeding going on there. But uh, we removed the magazine and now we can remove the magazine well. The magazine release on this, it uh, is not ambidextrous, but it can be configured either right or left side. I have got it set up on the right side, but that's the magazine well release. It's also the magazine release, so when you uh, want to remove magazines, you depress this button. So we depress that button, like so, and then the magazine well comes out. Why would you want the magazine well to come out? Well, a couple reasons. One, yeah, good for maintenance, good for cleaning, that sort of thing. There is your release spring and all of that. That's all well and good. But the other reason why you would want this to come out is, remember, this is chambered in 9mm. What else is chambered in 9mm? A lot of handguns, right? 9mm, it is effectively a ubiquitous handgun cartridge these days, which means that a lot of people who have handguns have a 9mm handgun, which means that this being a 9mm rifle, wouldn't it be a great idea if the magazines for your 9mm handgun, say your Ruger SR9 or your Glock 17, 18, 19, 9mm Glock handguns, Chimes of Westminster. Wouldn't it be a great thing if the magazines for those worked in your 9mm rifle? Well, they can. We're on the hour, so we're going to have to do a jump cut. As I was saying, wouldn't it be a great thing if your magazines for your Ruger SR9, your Glock 17, 18, 19, 9mm handguns worked in your 9mm rifle? Yes, it would be a great thing, wouldn't it? So Ruger thought of that when they made the PC carbine. This mag well here, this magazine well, you will notice here on the bottom it is embossed. You probably can't read it. R9, R40 is what that says there. This is meant for the Glock. Security 9 SR9 magazine, which happens to be what this is. 
this was uh, this is a Ruger magazine. It's meant for an SR9, but it also works in this quite obviously. Um, this firearm came with its own magazine, which was effectively identical to this one, uh, but the, this one I did purchase not aftermarket because it is a Ruger magazine, but I did get this after the fact because I wanted uh, a proper 10 round magazine for this rather than a converted one because the magazine that originally came with this rifle was not state compliant, which meant that I had to get it uh, converted over to become state compliant. But uh, I don't like it as much, it's a little bigger and it just doesn't have the form factor. So 10 rounder is what I got and uh, that's what it is. But yes, Magwell, it's interchangeable because you have interchangeable magazines. This will also work with Glock magazines. It'll work with a number of aftermarket magazines if you want, just by swapping out the Magwell as we showed you. There is a second one that comes with it that's made for Glock magazines, and I believe that they make a couple others as well, which is just really, really neat. At any rate, it's time to start reassembling this thing. So the easiest part we're gonna do first, we're just going to put our Magwell back in place. We're just gonna put it there in the slot. We're gonna make sure that the ejector is facing forward. And then we will quite simply push our mag release on this side. We go down into the hole, release, and then it is all nice and secure. Very cool. And we can set the stock aside for now because there's nothing else that we need to do with this at the moment. The next thing that we do have to work with though is our bolt assembly, okay? And this is effectively just the reverse of everything that we have just done. So all this means is, tilt you down a little bit more. All this means is we're going to take our dead blow weight and we're just going to drop that in like so, right? Next thing that we're gonna do, we're gonna take our firing pin and then we're gonna drop that in like so. Real easy. We'll take our firing pin spring and we'll put that back over the top of the firing pin. And then we're going to take our breech face and we're going to line it up. This flange here on the bottom lines up with this flange here on the bottom. Put that hole over the uh, end of the firing pin Get it in there. There we go. Takes a moment sometimes to get everything properly lined up and happy. However, once it is, it goes in like a glove, almost like, hey, it's designed to go in that way. We come back up top side like so. Keep some tension there on the breech face and then drop your pins in. They literally just fall into place like so. Keep your tension on for the second pin just so these things are going in symmetrically. Pins are in, release, and you're done, right? So your action is already mostly reassembled just like that firing pin, the firing pin spring, the breech face, and your two retainer pins, and of course your dead blow weight putting it all together on this end. You should see the blunt side of the firing pin through the back of the bolt. If you don't see that, then you've put it together the wrong way or you have forgotten your firing pin. Either way, it's not a good look. So that is reassembled for the time being. The next thing that we need to do is put our extractor back in. So our extractor group right here, this is the extractor itself, the extractor spring, and the extractor retaining pin. This goes together just like the rest of the action in the exact inverse of how it came together. So our extractor spring goes vertically into the hole. This is our forward side of the extractor, remember that? So the wide flange goes forward into the chamber like so, and it just sits in the gap. Not like that, obviously. It sits in the gap like that, right? So now, maintaining a fair amount of pressure on this thing, what you're gonna do 
And by fair amount of pressure, I mean a fair amount of pressure because that's a very um, strong spring. You're going to take your pin, you're going to drop it in from the top. You're going to play with the uh, tension on the extractor while you're feeding that through because it should go through with uh, a minimum of resistance. If it doesn't go through like it's uh, not doing right now, it means that your extractor is too far forward. So we got the extractor further to the rear. And then all you do is just try that again. And there you go, the pin went in that time. You can release your tension on the extractor and that's in. So now we have our extractor back in. We have got our breech face, firing pin spring, firing pin, dead blow weight, and all the retainer pins are in. I've got good tension on the firing pin there. The spring is returning it, so I know the spring is in, and I don't see the spring on the table either. So all of that is fantastic news. Next thing that we're going to do is we're going to reintegrate our bolt carrier plate, which is this, and our recoil spring with our rubber stopper here. Put them back together. And the carrier plate just goes right on like so. And obviously that is the spring tension that you are overcoming when you pull the charging handle. Now that that's been completed, we can take our receiver casement again. We flip this upside down, because remember we are upside down now, and we just drop it in, right? So, make sure that we are clear and everything. Sometimes it takes a try or two, there we go. That goes in. Make sure that our spring is straight up here in terms of our um, rubber stopper. We can press that a little bit and everything falls forward and into position. Do a quick positioning check. You should see your extractor here and this is now forming the chamber again. So real cool. Next thing that we're going to do to start locking everything back together is we are going to begin to uh, put our bolt handle back on. Let's tilt you down a little more. There you are. So bolt handle with our screw already inside, like so. Um, obviously it's, it's at this point that you can choose where you want it. I'm gonna keep it on the right hand side. You can put it on the left if you want, but uh, it does obviously always eject from the right. So do keep that in mind. Let's put that into position. Get our screwdriver engaged and get our screw engaged on those threads. I under, understand that I am turning to the left right now because I'm just trying to make sure that we're not cross-threading. Things are grabbing a little bit too quick for my liking, and I don't particularly like that, but there we go. We've got good contact now. And now we just give this a bit. There we go. You don't want to do this too tight, as I mentioned before, but you don't want to do it too loose either, because hopefully, and I say hopefully because it's happened to me once, but um, hopefully, if this does come loose in use, you will get some warning before it comes completely loose and flies off because obviously when the uh, round fires, it's gonna blow this bolt back really quick. And if this is in any way loose, it could fly backward and it could hit you. It could hit anyone standing behind the firing line. It's, it doesn't weigh nothing and it's got a fair bit of velocity accrued. So it could do some damage to somebody. I had it come loose once, I didn't have it come off, but uh, I did feel that it was loose when I charged the uh, firearm and uh, made me stop shooting until I rectified that problem. So just keep that in mind. There are torque specs for these, um, but in my experience, aside from that one malfunction, which was a malfunction on the assembly, which was my fault, um, I haven't had any issues with that. There are torque specs to these, but again, my experience has been just tighten them to the point where you can't tighten no more. <laughs> and that's about it. 
beyond that, uh, next bit is just going to be to start uh, buttoning this thing back together with the trigger, which is what we shall do presently. Right, so for this step we're going to have this upside down once again, and upside down meaning the rails are on the ground. So there we go. And our trigger then goes in back here, like so, upside down. We're going to line up the holes on the trigger with the holes on the receiver, like that. Push the trigger forward a little bit so it starts to engage the hammer. That'll help you line up. And then your pins, they go in, like so. Doesn't matter which one you start with, but you'll notice that there is a little bit of free play initially getting this uh, buttoned up, and that's because sometimes the trigger does not completely seat very well, which means that you're going to have to give it a little bit of downward persuasion, and you heard that click. So now the trigger is in position, and generally it's the rear side of the trigger that does not go into position first go around. So just be mindful of that. And of course, if you do that, and this is one of the things that can happen. I didn't, I didn't do that intentionally, but I'm uh, glad that it happened because I want to show you what to do if it does. Our trigger spring came out, right? How does this go back in? You will see on this side of the hammer, there is this uh, little flange. This goes in like so. And then you gotta watch out that you don't get the uh, trigger spring mislocated. There is a little circular cutout right here that you can see from this angle, but the uh, circular side of the trigger spring's gotta sit inside there so that when it goes back together, it's uh, solid. Oh, you can see no light coming through there anymore, so that is where it needs to be. Very cool, very cool. I like all of that. Feels good. I think we're a little bit too eager there. This is the most finicky thing that does happen when it does happen. Yeah, just a wee bit eager. And again, this is uh, one of those things that you just want to, if you're going to do it, you want to do it right. So no rushing, no getting frustrated. See, it's not sitting straight. That has to be straight in order for this to work. Again, just making sure that I don't see any light coming through there. And the reason why I'm holding here is I am not satisfied with the feel of that hammer. I want to feel a little bit of deflection in that spring, which tells me that it's properly seated. And I'm not getting that at the moment. And it's just where uh, patience and observation is very important. So the last thing you want to do is do something that's going to compromise the functionality of the firearm or the safety of it. If there is a trick that anybody knows to make this step a little easier, do let me know. Greatly appreciate it. Not a deal breaker if you don't. Right, this is what I wanted. That behavior. That's uh, not what I was getting. I was uh, running into a wall right at this point. So that's what I wanted, and it's just a matter of getting that spring in the right position in order for that to happen. However, now that that has happened, we can resume as we were. Just get everything back into position and start to get our pins in. 
sometimes, again, there will be a little bit of difficulty initially finding the, the uh, hole that they need to be in. But persevere. You can try the uh, forward or rearward holes. Doesn't matter which one goes in first. Just persevere, be gentle and deliberate. There we go. There's the rear. The front should be lined up and there it is, easy. Very, very cool. So now we have got our trigger back in, the pins are in, and obviously the uh, trigger is working again. So that's cool. Um, at this point, if you want, you can function test just like this. Um, obviously, the exposed moving parts present a little bit more of a hazard, um, but if you want a function test like this, you can. So, so there you go. And then safety obviously works. Safety off. Pin came out. Trigger. So that works. The reason why you don't do the function test though like that is because your pins come out as that one just did and uh, you know now you gotta put the pin back in but again that is how you can do the function test if you so desire however my much uh, preferred way to do that is to do it once the uh, action is back in the stock and the way we do that is exactly the inverse of how it came out so this just goes back in like so. Just like that. Give it a little bit of a press downward and you'll see these shut lines come together nicely. Our rear one first. You'll, fear it. you'll hear and feel it start to grab in. Once that starts to grab in, go back to your front one, or if you've done the front one first, go to your rear one, and then that'll start to pull everything back in the rest of the way. Go and lock these down now. All right. Back to the front. That works. Right, so we'll do our function test again. Now uh, doing it in a in a much more stable configuration. So I'm going to put my safety on like that. We're going to check first of all that the bolt will stay open when I use the bolt catch. All right, bolt stays open. We can release it. Right. We're going to test our trigger, first of all, safety. Safety works. Safety off. We'll pull the trigger. That works. So this is now back together. The next thing that we're going to do is open and lock the bolt again. Right? Because that is what you need to do for reassembly. Now we return to the barrel and the forend grip. Remember we took this apart in the beginning, we take this and put it back together now at the end. So all we do is line up the uh, window and the lever, the takedown lever, and then the little screw here will start to line itself up on its own accord because there's only one way it can go in and that's when the uh, lever and the window are lined up. So like everything else, Start slow, and then once you know that you've got good purchase on those threads and you're not going to cross them, you tighten that down until you can't tighten no more. And then that's about it. So our barrel and our forend grip back together. So now we have got the rifle back in the taken down configuration, and this is the storage and transport configuration that you'd expect to see it in. And now the very last part of how this works, the final reassembly and function check. So we have got here the stock with our action, our receiver, our bolt, our trigger, 
all of that. We have got an empty chamber, and I know that because, first of all, we are disassembled, so we physically cannot load this in this configuration. But I can also see that we have got an open bolt, and obviously the finger check says my finger goes through the entire thing, so no, there's no ammunition in there. And then, of course, we have got our forend and our barrel right there. Just as we did before, we take the receiver end and the fore end, we mate them at about 45 degrees, they go in, and we lock that in place. And that is now fully assembled. Very little bit of play between them, but it's really just between the uh, fore end grip and the stock. The barrel is not moving at all. Then function check. We have got an empty chamber, physical and visual check, empty, right there, empty mag, good. We can close the bolt, we can take our safety off, pull our trigger, that works, trigger reset. There it was, pull our trigger, and that is a good function check. And there we go. So that is how you disassemble and reassemble the Ruger PC carbine. A little bit of a different video for you, but uh, I hope that those of you who either have this rifle or were considering uh, to get this rifle, hope it was informative for you. And uh, yeah, we had a little bit of a snag in uh, putting the trigger assembly back together happens sometimes, just something to be aware of, and I'm glad it did happen because, well, that's just uh, another reason um, for you to, you know, learn about something and to get a sense of what the rifle is like to live with and how do you solve little issues like that. But real, real nice rifle and uh, very glad to have it and uh, very glad that uh, you have joined me on this little extravaganza here today. So until next time. I do thank you all very much for watching, for Iron Man 601 saying thanks, and of course, we will see you soon.